I'm going to talk more about the eviction moratorium and what's going to happen. I think this is a massive crisis. Uh, it hasn't been resolved. I'll talk about that. But yeah, I was just accused of harassment by Anna Kasparian for basically an interview I did with Corey Bush, where I just walked up to Corey Bush. I just simply walked up to her. Uh, she was really the only member of the squad there. I said, hi, I'm Max Blumenthal. Can I interview you about what's going on? And she said, yes. And she was happy to do so. Uh, you can see the full interview. I posted it all on my Twitter account. We had been working for um, um, months, sending letters to the CDC, asking them to go ahead to get this more this um, this extension done for months. Yeah. Not just my yeah. office, but yeah. other offices too. And and and, and do you, have you gotten any help from Pelosi? Has she? Do you have any confidence in her it's, ability it's to about, ram this through? Yeah, it's not. It's not even the thing is right now. It's not about the it's, speaker. It's not no, about Pelosi. No. Right now, we got two, two and a half, three hours. We need the president because we can't get Congress right. members right back here fast enough. Right now, in two, in two and a half. And, three and hours. how do you? How, how would you? What would you say about yeah, the president? I mean, I mean, how? Yeah, we need the president right now with the CDC to go ahead and they, the president but has done not, an it has done an executive order to get the extension done before. We well, need that. To why not? Right why now. hasn't he done it? Why is he forcing I, this not, whole thing? I, I, I don't know, but I know right now Could it be because he's status quo, Joe. I mean, I don't know. So, well, one thing we have to remember is that the Supreme Court said that it's not on the White House to get this done, that it is on Congress. And so when we got that information that we needed to get this done, we had two days. Yeah. Now. Before that, I can't speak to, I wasn't in those leadership yeah. conversations to know what happened before that. All I know is that when we got the, we sent the letter last week saying, hey, President, uh, CDC, can you all get this extension done? And then we got the word a few days later that Congress needed to take up a vote. So that's where we are. And I heard like last night there was a lot less people. It's great to see so many more people. But I heard there was an intense debate about the role of the squad and why the squad didn't leverage its vote for the speaker for Medicare right. for all vote and why the squad, I mean, with the margin so narrow in Congress, why the squad didn't um, you know, yes, because, leverage its, 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 its right. vote on the stimulus to get a $15 minimum wage. What? No, no. So first, one thing that was said last night, which is something that is very true. And I wish we would have talked about that. This was where your conversation was going because we're talking about the rally for tonight. And I really would love to keep the conversation on what's happening. I feel like it's all related people. to health care and, and the. And it absolutely is. But this is the thing. What was said last night is that this bill, Medicare for all, is not. No, there's no person on the squad whose bill that is. That is. Bernie Sanders bill in the Senate. It is Pamela Jayapal's bill in the House. It is not our bill. We cannot make that bill come to the floor. There is nothing that we can do legally to get the bill to the floor. We have But Pelosi could have brought the bill to the floor. We're, we're good here, thank you. Well, what, well, I'm sorry, Max, well, we're fine with this. Why I'm can't she answer the question? We're here to talk about the eviction. But I feel like it's all about health care. Thank you. No, really appreciate it. We appreciate your we're time. Here for, we're you. here for a reason. It's about the more time. Well, Thank you why, so why is that I can't ask about Medicare for all? But the congresswoman has slept one hour. She's done a lot of labor. I, okay, I, I'm trying I to get people work. out here, too. I respect your work. I'm trying to do the same thing uh, you all are doing. Thank you for being here. But why appreciate can't you. she could just answer it and then I go away? I'm not trying to like Thank attack you. her or anything. So I'm not trying can, to, to smear her. Contact. We're happy to give you a contact and you can reach But why is that issue the Medicare for all vote so Like she was wrapping up her. But she was wrapping up her. I know she was happy, wrapping up I'm her happy, answer. Then I was going to say thank you, oh, everybody. Come out. I appreciate. But that. why didn't you let her just wrap up her I, answer? I really appreciate you. We're happy to give you a contact. You can feel free to reach out. Thanks. So much. All right. Thanks. It was a ver generally very friendly interview, and I was trying to draw attention to what she was doing because the media hadn't shown up yet. I was. I, I'm not saying that I'm the greatest journalist, or, but I was probably the most high-profile journalist to have been there at that point. The big wigs weren't really coming down, um, you know, for the, 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 the photo op hadn't really begun. And so, you know, my idea was to give her some shine and then to ask about why the squad doesn't leverage their votes more. And I didn't just ask about force to vote. I asked about uh, why they didn't leverage their vote on the stimulus to get a $15 minimum wage. I mean, they all voted for the stimulus, which just put more wealth into the hands of the top 001%. It was a giant corporate giveaway. 
Uh, the only person who really held up the stimulus was uh, Thomas Massey, and he was demonized. So th I think these are still relevant questions. And of course, her staff man blocked me. Then a proxy of the squad who is running for like a local government position here in the suburbs. Uh, she kind of suggested afterwards in a Twitter thread that Anna Kasparian read out that I was, uh, and that those who question them are racist and sexist. Of course, it's the most predictable response. And then Anna capitalizes on that by accusing me of harassment. And she also, you know, was upset about me confronting Adam Schiff. Now, the squad was always there, all of them, especially AOC. And I was always in their vicinity. And I had the opportunity to go up to them. And I could have berated them for many things, including AOC signing an uh, anti-China resolution supporting Hong Kong separatists alongside Ted Cruz. I mean, there are many things I could have brought up, but I didn't do it because I didn't think that was the place for it. And I did, I did support overall what they were trying to do. But what I didn't, what I couldn't stand and what I found so disgusting was to see Adam Schiff, this warmonger who has literally supported every war of my lifetime, and not just the wars, but also the sanctions, the regime change operations, the CIA-backed death squads, all of that. He supports that aggressively, and then he distinguished himself as the leading voice, like the central neocon narrator of Russiagate for the congressional Democrats. And the whole point of Russiagate was besides trying to take out Trump in this futile, desperate attempt, was to ramp up a new Cold War, jack up the military budget, and it was driven by the bureaucratic inertia of the national security state in Washington with Schiff on the Intelligence Committee as their spokesman. So all of that time could have been spent talking about housing, talking about social programs, talking about poverty, talking about inequality, talking about Trump's trillion dollar tax cut. But that's not what happened. Adam Schiff focused progressives and even people who went out and protested George W. Bush's war invasion of Iraq and focused them squarely on Russia, Russian collusion, Russiagate, and that whole hysterical narrative. So the, I thought that this was a red line. So I approached Adam Schiff and I first asked him about his vitriolic anti-Palestinian opinions and his support for Israel. Four billion dollars a year for Israel. He's very supportive of that. Representative Schiff, Representative Schiff, do you think we could reallocate four billion dollars from apartheid Israel to free housing for Americans? The four billion that you allocate every year to apartheid Israel. Why? Why? Jesse Jackson opposes all the wars you support. Je Representative Schiff, Jesse Jackson opposes all the wars you support. Can we give them a, a moment, please? Can we just give them a moment, please? Yeah. What about, all, is there any war you have opposed, Representative Schiff? Is there any war you've opposed? Those wars cost a lot that could be spent on housing for Americans. Can we just give them a moment, please? What has Adam Schiff done but talk about a new Cold War with Russia, supporting Israel, giving money to war instead of the poor? He stands for everything Martin Luther King was against. And he's here for a phony photo op. This pro-war right-wing Democrat wants a photo op with Jesse Jackson when Jesse Jackson opposes every war that he supported. Why did you support the genocide in Yemen? Why do you support the brutal assaults on Palestinians? Hey, Why not? He's can a pro-war legislator. Can you please this stop? Is we, this is something of, not about You don't this. control this. The people I don't, control this. But they're, they're here with their time. They are taking time for us as He's the people. He's here for a photo op. He no, gives he all our not. money to war. Please stop. War is part of the topic. Look, look you you have the freedom of speech, but this is about something else. This is about people's homes. Yes. People are going Why are through a crisis right now. we spending $4 billion on Israel every year instead of free housing for Americans? Thank you so much. $4.5 trillion. Yes. Adam Schiff doesn't agree. He should be pressured. This is not your friend. 
$4 billion a year to apartheid Israel. We need to put pressure on these people who are giving our money away that should be spent on free housing. That was a red line to have Schiff show up. I asked him about that. He he turned away. You know, he looked like a wax museum sculpture. And all along, he was taking photo ops with Jesse Jackson, who for, you know, whatever criticism of you, him you can make, Jesse Jackson has opposed every war that Adam Schiff supports. And the last time I'd seen Jesse Jackson before he arrived at the U.S. Capitol was actually outside the Venezuelan embassy when we, the Venezuelan Embassy Protection Collective, were trying to hold off this pro-Guaido right-wing regime change mob of rabid gusanos. And Jesse Jackson broke through their lines. They even tried to physically assault him and delivered food to our friends inside the embassy. And it was really the last straw for the police. That's when they raided the embassy through every the last four out, prosecuted them. But Jesse Jackson put himself on the line like that while he's fighting Parkinson's. And so Adam Schiff is taking photo ops with him, trying to make himself seem like a civil rights hero. So I confronted him. And Anna Kasparian took issue with that. She took issue with that because it, she called him a good person who is trying to do good things. Now, that really says everything about TYT and people on the other side of the line here. Now, what's going on? Like we see so much infighting in what passes for the left in the United States. What's going on is that the TYT crowd has attached themselves to the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party has been unable to deliver anything in the realm of material change for anyone. And that has led to disillusionment and anger and people moving to support, for example, a People's Party or the Green Party or just challenging Democrats from the left, but not within the acceptable channels. The acceptable channels are, you know, the Howard Dean campaign, where he claimed he was representing the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party. We see what Howard Dean has turned into. He's basically a straight up right wing corporate Democrat now who also lobbies for the Iranian people's MEK. Then you've got uh, the squad. They represent this new generation of the acceptable channel of challenging the Democrats from the left. It's the, it's the AOC model of politics, and it's working within the confines of the Democratic Party, but with using radical rhetoric. So at, outside the Capitol, it's really fascinating to be there you would see Jamal Bowman get up and he was wearing a, a shirt that said Wakanda, but the W is shaped like a Wu-Tang W. And he's like, peace and love everybody. You know, he's, he's down with the struggle. He, he said that we stand against colonialism and we stand against white supremacy. Uh, but Jamal Bowman really has not supported the BDS movement. And he gratuitously attacked Cynthia McKinney a few weeks ago in, in someone who's just an irrelevant figure at this point and is not part of the Democratic Party and accused her of anti-Semitism, which was such a clear way of him trying to show that as he occupies Elliot Engel's former seat in New York, that he's one of the good ones. Okay. And then he, but he's out there talking about we're against colonialism, we're against white supremacy. Um, and then AOC gets up and says, we are uh, not subscribing to the the wing, the, the brand of politics that believes you have to be gentle, that believes you have to be kind. We believe that confrontation is necessary, which is, you know, obviously funny considering her refusal to confront Pelosi, to confront her party on the stimulus, and her ref reference to Pelosi as mama bear. But it's 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 what really passes for acceptable leftism in the US today and just very radical presentation, but a liberal agenda. And the whole presentation of what was taking place, which, well, I, I can't condemn it completely because it was something that they did to at least delay imminent eviction. I mean, Cori Bush does deserve credit for it, but the presentation was as a sit in, as a people's movement. And it was not actually a people's movement, most of the people there were within this very tight organizing network 
It was controlled by the Congress people and their staff. The messaging was controlled. Anyone who wanted to get close to uh, any of them pretty much had to pass through a phalanx of staffers. They were engaging with some activists, but they controlled all the messaging, the human mics, and so on. And so the demands of any people's movement were not being heard. The demands were what was achievable within the status quo of Democratic Party politics and with the, a Democrat in the White House. Now, what was achievable? I see Ben is here, so I'm going to just kind of wrap it up there. What was achievable was to get a temporary targeted eviction moratorium. And I'll be repeating these points in more detail in my um, stream at Rockfin. But what they achieved was actually less than I even realized when it when they declared victory. So I think it was three days ago, Cori Bush went on Twitter and declared that we have moved mountains because of the CDC declaration of a targeted eviction moratorium of no evictions for now in districts in the country where people are facing the so-called Delta variant. And that does cover 90% of the population. I think these are like high density urban districts. But the problem is Brett Kavanaugh still has the power to slap down that CDC decision any day. So they may have only bought people a few days still in their homes. It's going back to the Supreme Court. And what did Joe Biden do? Joe Biden, you know, he's known for errant talk. He's known for errant hair sniffing of young women. He's, he's not really able to control himself. And so he went out and said that, I don't think that this uh, CDC decision will pass constitutional muster. So he basically prejudiced the Supreme Court decision, which is imminent, and provided justification as a Democratic president for Kavanaugh to strike down the eviction moratorium finally. Now, if Kavanaugh, who is a pet project of the Republican Party in corporate America, somehow decides that the eviction moratorium stands, then it goes back to Congress. And what, what happens then? Well, then we see the real face of the Democratic Party. It's actually kind of like an inadvertent force the vote, where we'll see all these right-wing Democrats in the House who are corporate pet projects themselves, basically lobbyists parading as lawmakers. And in the Senate, Mansion, Cinema, and the usual suspects will vote it down. And then the Biden administration will come back and say, it's the fault of Mansion, it's the fault of Cinema, it's the fault of the Republican Supreme Court, it's all their fault. And then where is the squad in all this? Well, they won some kind of moral victory and kept people in their homes for a few days. And TYT gave them a pat on the back because they want, you know, they obviously have skin in the game with the Democratic Party. And then 11 million people get thrown out of their homes. And where were we addressing this as a crisis of capitalism? Where were we calling for canceling the rent? Where were the people? Well, there are still people up at the Capitol now. And that's what they're trying to do. So if you're watching this and you're in the D.C. area or want to come here, you should go join them and actually start a real people's struggle. Uh -huh.